Hey, this is our hotel now. We live here. Well, not you, man. What the fuck you think you do? Welcome to episode 148 for the New York Times Global Vision Podcast. This is your trusty host, Shlomo Davidstein. Johannesburg, the city of gold, once a beacon of hope for the prosperity of the African continent, is now devolving into a state of chaos and anarchy. Millions of people are left without power and fearing for their lives. I'm joined by Django Dehenar Vanderplunk, our South African culture reporter, calling in live from his home city of Johannesburg. Django, tell us about the tragic blackouts that you have been reporting on. Uh, hello, Shlomo. Uh, last Thursday, I was sitting in my room reading how to be anti-racist when all of a sudden the lights went out. I stepped outside to see what was going on, but I quickly noticed the entire city block was engulfed in darkness. I could hear gangs of thugs ransacking the streets, thirsting for white blood. But due to their skin tone, these criminals blended in with the darkness and were completely invisible. It was horrifying, very scary. These rolling blackouts have been occurring since 2013, but they keep getting worse and worse. You see, throughout the city, gangs of thieves have been stealing copper electrical cables to sell a scrap metal on the black market. Ooh, tell me about this black market. Is it as shadowy and licentious as it sounds? Uh, no, it's called tutus. It's very easy to find, and the black residents go there to openly barter goods pillaged from the whites. Oh, I see. Oh yes, Johannesburg has become a hotbed of corruption and there's no accountability, no one for us to turn to. And rather than solve this issue with the blackouts, the government has just been diverting the power away from the city and towards the Musk family emerald mines. So we South Africans find ourselves in the dark, literally. We've had 23 mayors in the last two years. That's practically a new mayor for every month. Just today we elected John Mayer. He may be the only hope we have, although with his minuscule amount of melanin, he seems unlikely to even last a month. John Mayer? I love him. I love him in a heartbeat. Don't you think he could be the next Nelson Mandela? I believe you just fell victim to the Mandela effect. This is a term for when a fallacy spreads throughout the collective unconscious and gets internalized by a great number of people. In this case, many people falsely believe that a man named Nelson Mandela fought to end apartheid and was elected the first president of South Africa. In fact, his real name was Nelson Mandela and he died in prison before he could be elected. The real first president of South Africa was Morgan Freeman. Oh wow, you're imparting all this African wisdom but there's still so much of Africa that I still need to absorb. So let's talk about this. How exactly did Johannesburg get here? Bring me back to the start of all this chaos. Well, South Africa has long been the wealthiest and most prosperous country on the African continent due to its abundance of natural resources and for no other reason at all. But after the end of apartheid in 1994, white citizens began fleeing the city of Johannesburg and were replaced by migrants from all over sub-Saharan Africa. Thus, Johannesburg evolved to become a diverse, multicultural paradise. But for reasons that researchers haven't been able to determine, the crime rate has increased rapidly in the decades since the white flight. A state of crisis is the new normal in Johannesburg. We've become used to disasters occurring quite frequently in the city. How tragic. Can you describe for us more of these disasters that you've fallen victim to? Yes, a few weeks ago, a street quite literally exploded in downtown Johannesburg. Gangs of thugs had tapped into the natural gas pipelines to get high by huffing the fumes, and too much gas built up and it ignited. Cars and carcasses flew many meters into the air. You'd think the sights of these would shock people, but we South Africans are used to it. God! Yes, well, thank goodness nearly all of the casualties were whites. Poor black residents of South Africa have suffered long enough forced by socioeconomic conditions beyond their control to become violent criminals who ravage, rape, and slaughter their white oppressors. Yes, it's very important to note that the black people are still the real victims here, being forced against their will to genocide the whites. Now, what other crises have become common over the past few months? Well, the new trend among the gangs is house hijacking. That's where a group of gang members forces their way into someone's home and start taking over the rooms. They'll say, we live here, no. The residents are forced to pay rent to these gang members or else face serious violence. I would love it if a group of black men forced their way into my home, but I could see how that could be problematic for others if it wasn't done consensually. 
But how many of these hijacked houses are out there? Uh, yeah, Bill, this is a serious problem. There could be as many as 600 of these hostage houses in Johannesburg. It's so scary that a house can quite literally be stolen. Me and my wife, Gugu, who's black, by the way, white South Africans are such bores, we had our house stolen by a gang of thieves earlier this year. They tried to force us to live in only one room and charge me half my income in rent. That's why we were forced to move into this hotel. These are truly complex issues. But you know you must work together with the gangs to come to an equitable solution. What would you propose to be done about all of this? Well, it's clear that the affirmative action policy has failed as the black residents still feel the need to turn to a life of crime. I believe that these anti-white crime waves will only end once all of the whites have gone out of Johannesburg. As I see it, the solution is to move the whites out of the city to set them apart in their own white slums. Very interesting. Thanks, Django. So, do you have any parting thoughts on the situation in Johannesburg? Yes, even though these tragic blackouts are occurring, Johannesburg is still a great place for tourists to visit, especially if you're not pale. Come to our famous Joe Burgers, white meat only. Well, that wraps up this episode of the Global Vision Podcast, sponsored by the Fertility Society of Africa and NUCP, the Nubian Community Project. To all the white South Africans out there, good night and good luck. Thank you for listening to the New York Times Global Vision Podcast. If you like what you heard, you may enjoy some of our other offerings. Here's a quip from our world-renowned technology podcast, Tech Bonus. Okay, let me pull up something I made last night with my Willy. Oh, wow. So, uh, these images were generated using Will E, which, for those of you who aren't in the know, is, uh, the new OpenAI text-to-image generation program. Yes, exactly. Can you see this? Yes, this is like, it looks like a series of nude men wearing fire hats and being filleted by monkeys. That's right, and the prompt I gave for this was, male capuchin monkey performing oral sex on a hunky firefighter digital art. So, Will E released ten images in different styles, and I think they all look pretty good. This one on the top left, it's almost photorealistic. You can see all the veins on the cock, the individual strands of fur, and everything. And this one next to it, it's like a 2D cartoon. The monkey looks very anthropomorphized and like something you might see in a Disney cartoon. This is incredible. I'm not sure if it's these images of sexy men getting blown by little monkeys or the fact that they were generated by AI, but I think I'm getting a tech boner right now. Oh yeah, me too. My tech boner is tingling. Today's episode was produced by Seth Simmons, Ernie Osthausen, and Brando Wayans. It was edited by Nig O'Hara and engineered by Bree Roche with assistance from her disability monkey, Moyo. The on-site location consultants were Tyra Wiener and Tokyo Sex Wallet. It contained original music by Jeffrey Blackman and aboriginal music by Janigma Ubuntu. Special thanks to Chile Asabuko and the Drexel University Africana Studies Program. This edition of the Global Vision Podcast is dedicated to Django Dehenar Vanderplum, who was murdered immediately following the recording of the episode. Rest in peace, Django. This is Shlomo Davidstein, and that's it for the Global Vision Podcast. We'll see you next time.